Next up is uh, Charles Atkinson. Thank you, uh, Charles Atkinson, SpaceLaunchNews.com. John, what technical differences, if any, are there between the new ammonia tank and the old one? And are there plans to carry this old one back to station refilled next year? Um, I don't have the exact details on any design changes. Uh, I know this one is full, and uh, that's that's the primary goal. The other one's been on orbit, I think, since uh, 2002. And uh, so it needs to come down and be refurbished, uh, and, and the intention is to, I believe, take it back up to station. Okay. Um, do you have a flight plan for that one, returning it to station, or? I don't have that information with me right now. Um, okay, and one last one, please. Uh, Discovery marked her 5,000th orbit of the Earth this morning. It was around 350. I was wondering if you could, if I could get your thoughts on that milestone. It's been a week of milestones with a silver anniversary of Discovery. Um, yeah, the, uh, the shuttle is an amazing vehicle, and, and uh, Discovery's had a, a, a long history with us. Um, we're definitely uh, um, um, looking forward to these last shuttle flights, and uh, you know, to think um, doing the uh, No Vern rendezvous on uh, on the anniversary that you mentioned was definitely uh, something to think about and something that we all reflected upon. Um, uh, we're we're very happy with that vehicle. Thank you. And uh, Charles, to answer your question about the tank, when it will be refurbished and sent back up, that'll be launched on STS-131 in March. Uh, next up on the phone bridge is Tark Malik with Space.com. Thank you very much. Um, Don, I had a, uh, <clears throat> a follow-up for the, the debris question. Earlier today, I guess there was a talk about an option of delaying the spacewalk to, um, uh, to Friday and, and doing a, a different type of maneuver. I'm just kind of curious about the decision process in um, and choosing, I guess, to wait until after the spacewalk rather than delay it, um, if it's just more than avoiding mission impact. Thanks. Yeah, that, that was a, uh, we, basically we've been in an de um, ongoing developing process on the uh, procedures for doing uh, the uh, uh, primary RCS uh, reboost and the maneuvers that would be required to do that. Um, initially, we thought the maneuver time was going to be a lot longer. We had protected up to 30 minutes. It turns out that uh, after looking at the specific case that we're in, um, that uh, the maneuver time is very small. And so the primary, the bulk time of, of the activity is going to be the reboost itself. So we basically saved a significant amount of time. Also, if we had to look at de-boost options for some reason, that would have been a much longer maneuver, uh, significantly longer time to maneuver. So uh, all that would have backed us further into the EVA time, and that would have necessitated us thinking about uh, deferring the EVA, adding the plus one day in that time frame to do that. Um, in, the, in the details, as the, as the uh, details came through and, uh, and the analysis came through, we, we, figured, we figured out a way to fit it into the end of the day and not impact the EVA. And so that was the best case because that gives us more runway in front of us as far as uh, contingency goes for that plus one day if we need it. Thank you. And then just as a, a quick follow-up, you mentioned earlier that you know, the, there's a high confidence that you won't have to do the, the maneuver at all. Um, so I'm just kind of curious, is it, is it just the, the growing knowledge of the tracking that makes that confidence possible? And is something this large um, passing close by the station something that could conceivably be seen from the, the spacecraft by the astronaut, uh, depending on lighting? Thank you. Uh, actually, with the highly elliptical orbit, it'll pass by so fast, um, and I haven't looked if it's day or night, but uh, it's highly unlikely at three kilometers the crew will see anything. Um, we'll definitely advise them. They already know uh, about this uh, um, time of closest approach, so um, as we get closer, we'll, we'll continue to work those details. Um, uh, so I, I, don't, uh, I don't think that they'll be able to see anything. Uh, I forget the first part of this question. Was Tark, was there another part to your question? Yeah, I was just curious about the, the it seems like the team is very confident that they, that they won't have yeah. to do the maneuver at all, but you're protecting for it. Um, if it's just the, the growing knowledge of its, of its position and path that gives you that confidence or, um, or I guess, something else. That's, that's exactly right. It's, again, like I said, it's highly elliptical. It's uh, a, a little bit difficult to track as far as getting uh, good, good sights to see it. Um, but we are getting more and more data and we're getting more and more accuracy. And as you get closer in, uh, uh, the orbits of the station and the uh, and shuttle station stack and, and, the, and the debris are better understood. And so that's allowing us the more certainty to, to be comfortable. Okay, I think we have some follow-up questions here in the room. 
Just a really quick one. You don't have to have the catalog number of that thing with you, do you? Uh, let's see. I, I do not have it with me, no. Okay. Thanks. We can get that. Okay. Seeing no other questions here in the room, I think that wraps up our briefing for tonight. We'll head back to live mission coverage. Uh, coming up next in the cruise day, the mission specialist Jose Hernandez and Danny Olivas are going to be answering questions that were submitted through YouTube and Twitter at 8.55 p.m. Central Time. And then after that, Olivas and Crystal, Christopher Fugelsang will be getting their camp out in the Quest airlock in, pre in preparation for the second spacewalk of the mission. That camp out starts at 1.54 a.m. and then the rest of the shuttle crew will be going to sleep at 3.30 a.m. Central Time. And we'll have our on-console interview with Space Station Flight Director at 9 a.m. And our next briefing will be after tomorrow's spacewalk. In the meantime, you can keep up with all the STS-128 mission events at the NASA website, www.nasa.gov. Thanks. Jeff, I think that's really it. When I first gone through the procedure, it was uh, a little difficult to understand the differences between the Lab 1P1 part and the, the actual kit part. But having seen the kit and uh, looking at Lab 1P1 internally, I think uh, it's going to be pretty straightforward. And I appreciate your help and uh, the procedure. That sounds great, Tim. Uh, we're certainly looking forward to having you execute that, and we're glad that everything uh, became much more clear once you got your hands on the hardware. It's always good to touch the hardware. In fact, I'll probably set this up uh, in advance of the procedure, so if there are any questions with respect to how it's configured, I can ask those prior to the scheduled time on flight day eight. That sounds like a great plan, Tim. All right, Jeff, well, thanks for your time. I appreciate the help. We'll be talking to you or uh, the Capcom about this on uh, flight day eight. Thank you very much, Tim. This is Mission Control Houston. Back uh, here in the Space Shuttle Flight Control Room, a handover underway as the Orbit 2 team of flight controllers is about to take over the shift. They will be led by Flight Director Quatsi Alabarujo with the assistance of spacecraft communicator Stan Love on the lower left-hand portion of your screen. The uh, crew is heading into uh, the home stretch of its workday, continuing cargo transfer from the Leonardo Multipurpose Logistics Module. Meanwhile, in the Quest airlock, Danny Olivas and Krister Fugel sang well into uh, spacewalk preparations. They will be uh, donning masks in the wee hours on Thursday to begin the process of pre-breathing pure oxygen, thus uh, equalizing their metabolic uh, conditioning uh, for the spacewalk on Thursday, the second of the mission, in which Olivas and Fugelsang will venture outside the Quest airlock at about 4.20 central time Thursday afternoon to begin a six and a half hour spacewalk, the fourth for each of the two spacewalkers of their careers, with the sole purpose uh, to install a new ammonia tank assembly filled with 600 fresh pounds of ammonia to provide cooling for the avionics and electronics on the Port One truss of the International Space Station, and then in turn to uh, mate and uh, berth in place on a cargo.